O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Give us the joy of your saving help, and sustain us with your life-giving spirit. A very warm welcome to our service today. It's very good to gather as the people of God, to enjoy God and be built up in the truth of him. The psalmist says, Let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. We'll be thinking today about how we're called to uh, to delight in and to enjoy God and the good things that he gives. And we're going to begin by doing that, by praising his name as the one who is the, the king of creation. Praise to the Lord, O oh, let all that is in me adore him. We recognise that we don't always adore God wholeheartedly as he deserves. Or give him the thanks. Sometimes we doubt his goodness to us. We err and stray from his command. But it is with great confidence that we can approach the throne of grace, knowing that we can be forgiven in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. We're reminded by the Apostle John, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And therefore, in light of that promise, we come to make our prayer of confession to God. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us. 
and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may God Almighty have mercy on us, forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collect for this third Sunday of Easter, the Church's Prayer. Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give to us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. Today's uh, New City Catechism question is, what is faith in Jesus Christ? Now the answer that they give is receiving and resting on him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. Now faith, I think, and I'm sure you'll agree, faith is a great thing, isn't it? But I think often uh, we can mistake it or misuse it, misunderstand it, um, about what it is or where it comes from. Here's a little video to just get, in, get us thinking about where faith might come from. Right, Oscar and Phoebe, in here I have got a present each for you, okay? Okay. Yeah, shall I give it to you? Yes. Okay, first, hold on, have you, why, why do you think you're getting this present? Have you, have, me? have I, have you, have you followed all my rules? Mm. Do you? Know. you do you always be extra good for me? Mm, I know. Did you eat all of your dinner today? Mm. Did you? No. No. You, neither of you ate your dinner, did you? Mm. But, yeah, and you got a treat. But, I'm giving you a gift anyway, aren't I? Yeah, because yeah. you love Because her. I love you. So, Oscar, there's yours. Wow. Phoebe, there's yours. Can I have a second? What do you think? Whoa! I didn't know a scorpion looked like that. Now, do you want to pay for these? Shall I take these back and make you follow the rules and then you can get them? No. It'd be a bit hard, wouldn't it? Yeah. How about a big thank you? Would that be nice? Yeah. Thank you. Do you think you'll try and follow the rules next time? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Now, the thing that we often miss out about faith is that it's a gift, an uh, undeserved and uh, unearned gift from God. He has given us faith to bring us close to him absolutely free. Now, I think another thing that we often forget or um, we need to know is what it means or what it looks like to, to have faith in something. Here's another little video. Okay, Oscar, Phoebe, what are you choosing today? We're going to have parachutes. parachutes. And what are you choosing the parachutes for, Oscar? To save our Mr. Tomatoes. Great, okay, come and choose which one and show the camera. And I'm going to choose this one. Okay, show me, let's have a look. Okay, let's pause the video and put our Mr. Tomatoes in. Drop it, Phoebe. Oh, no. It was a good parachute, but it got stuck on the side of the building. Okay, Oscar, you next. Oh no! Hope you enjoyed that. It was all a bit crazy. Um, often the world sees faith as putting our trust in something um, that we, we know nothing about, like blind faith. Um, a bit like Oscar and Phoebe, who really, they know nothing about aerodynamics or parachutes or how to keep an egg safe. But, and so they were put in their blind faith. They just picked one and went with it. But that's not really how it works with Jesus, is it? Um, when we put our faith in Jesus, he um, is the one with power. The one who proved throughout the Gospels that he is the one who deserves our faith. He is the one who can save us. That is not blind faith. That is using the God-given faith to trust the one God has given to save us. Jesus um, is the only one that we should be relying on to, 
to save ourselves. He's the only one that can make us right with God. That He's the only one that can make us justified again, which is just like living Jesus' life, Jesus' perfect life. And actually, when we look at Galatians 2, 15 to 21, it tells us that we can do no work to save ourselves. We can't do anything or do anything to make ourselves right with God. We would fail ultimately if we did that. It is only by seeking out Christ and receiving that gift of faith from God that will lead us to being justified, lead us to be saved and be right with God. So actually when we truly do this, we forsake all other things. We forget all the different things that we try to do to be on God's good side. We, we, we sometimes try and convince ourselves that actually if we just try that little bit harder to follow the rules or a little bit harder to make sure I do all my duties every day, all day, or if I do all the traditions every year, then it'll make me more godly. But actually, it's only through Christ, isn't it? We need to forsake all and say, I trust him. That is what it is to have faith. Now, I'm not saying that those things are bad. The traditions and, and laws, to, they are to bring us closer to God, to show others who we are putting our faith in. But they're not how we get faith. And it's not how we live by faith. Having faith is trusting God. It's actively trusting God with our lives. And that should reflect um, how we live, how we um, pray and how we read the Bible daily. So the question we had was what is faith in Jesus Christ? It's receiving and resting on him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the Gospels. Well, we're going to sing a song that celebrates our faith in Jesus. My sin on Christ, he died for me. The guiltless judge, the guilty free. So that as far as the east is from the west, our sins are cast away so far away. Let's sing.
Light is sweet, and it pleases the eyes to see the sun. However many years anyone may live, let them enjoy them all. But let them remember the days of darkness. For there will be many. Everything to come is meaningless. You who are young, be happy while you are young. And let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart. And whatever your eyes see, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. So then, banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body, for youth and vigour are meaningless. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. When the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop. When the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows grow dim. When the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades. When people rise up at the sound of birds but all their songs grow faint. When people are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire no longer is stirred, then people go to their eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well. And the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. This is the word of the Lord. Loving Heavenly Father, we pray that you would uh, uh, speak to us, that your spirit would uh, enliven your word to us that our hearts would be open to receive from you, to be built up in the truth of you, and to delight, to rejoice in all your good gifts. In Jesus' name. Amen. I think it was Terry Pratchett who said that inside every old person is a young person wondering what happened. Maybe you can relate Growing older is a kind of process, a parting of the ways between the head that stays young and the body that doesn't. There's a disconnect between uh, the face in the mirror and the face in the mind. And the process can leave you reeling. It happens so quickly, doesn't it? I think I'm old enough to begin to understand that. One minute you're looking forward to Santa coming and the next minute you're plucking hair out of your ears looking like Santa. And it just happens. As the writer says, as the teacher says in this passage, you know, youth is meaningless, as in it is vapour, it is fleeting, it passes so quickly. Well, how do we deal with it? Well, one way is denial. One way is denial. I mean, you've seen all those people in their 50s with their collars popped, walking around with their skate shoes on. I mean, it's just embarrassing, isn't it? Others will fight it with every fibre of their being and every coin in their pocket. And it was reported that there are 10 million non-essential cosmetic procedures in America every year. What was once the preserve of the rich and famous has become mainstream. And you walk into any department store, you go into John Lewis on that second floor in Liverpool 1, uh, and what happens, you're immediately overtaken by choking clouds of anti-aging products, aren't you? that are served to you by a uniformed army of orange people whose foreheads don't move. The power of Botox, that permanent surprise look. And then there's people who embrace a strict diet and exercise routine, disciplining the body with superfoods and with green smoothies that look and smell like stagnant water. There's another approach, of course, which is just to become grumpy and bitter about getting older, resenting the youth with their cacophonous music and their stupid hair. Look at them with their bouncy ligaments and their full fringes. 
remind you of all your yesterdays. But today the only vitality you've got left is the power to be irritated by the sight of a strange piercing or a pair of overly bright training shoes. And so we grumble. Maybe you're well on your way to becoming Victor Meldrew, one foot in the grave. I find myself trying on his slippers with alarming frequency as life goes by. It's very easy to become filled with grumbling, isn't it? Uh, aching limbs and weighty weariness. Suddenly becoming disgruntled with the thoughtlessness of a neighbour or curmudgeonly towards rule breakers and risk takers. But here's the thing, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, and neither should it, because grumpiness breeds ingratitude. We receive good gifts from the giver. And we need to embrace the alternative. And that's what the teacher commends us to do in this passage. Yeah, we might have one foot in the grave, so to speak. But there is a better approach that makes the most of the other foot that's planted firmly on the path of life. So two points this morning. Rejoice in the gift and remember the giver. Rejoice in the gift and remember the giver. Rejoice in the gift. Look what the writer says. Life is Light is sweet and pleases the eye to see the sun. Of course, we can relate to that, can't we? Uh, this weekend, it's sunny and we feel the benefit, the warmth on our face, the bright mornings, the longer evenings. It gives us a lift. And essentially what the teacher is, uh, is reminding us is that God made the world good. Uh, God is a good God. Therefore, what he makes is, is, is good. And it's filled with good gifts. So make the most of it. Verse 8. However many years anyone may live, let them enjoy them all. Enjoy your years. All of them. Whilst ever you're not at the point of uh, sort of physically unravelling. Even though the wheels are a bit wobbly, they haven't come off yet. Or grab life with both hands and take delight in it. Enjoy it. Of course, that's not to say there won't be dark days. The writer is very explicit, even in the same verse, that dark days will come. He's already said in chapter 3 there'll be times of uh, seasons uh, of mourning and weeping. But what's our general disposition towards life? Is it grumbling or is it gratitude? Is it, is it to embrace life with, with both hands, to keep that foot firmly planted on the path of life and enjoy all the good things that God gives? Well... This is what we're commanded to do. Yes, I, that's what I said. This is what we're commanded to do. However many years anyone may live, let them enjoy them all. Does that sound strange to your ears, that, that God should so command? Well, uh, notice this. Verse 8, we get the kind of command to uh, enjoy. Then verse 9, if you're young, be happy. Uh, let your heart give you joy. Follow the ways of your heart. Whatever your eyes see, but in all these things, God will bring judgment. Be happy, God will bring judgment. Now, some people uh, look at these verses and, and they say, well, here's what's happening. Uh, this is a word in season to young people. Be happy and be joyful. Follow your heart, but remember God is watching. So don't get too carried away with the WKD, the Alka Pops and the parties. Well, I don't think that's what the teacher is really doing here. I think what he's saying is this. Enjoyment is a gift. Life is the gift of God and we're responsible for what we do with it. And God will call us to account for our enjoyment of it. One writer says this. That human beings are supposed to enjoy life to the full because that's their divinely assigned portion. And God calls one to account for failure to enjoy. Enjoyment is not only permitted, it is commanded. It is not only an opportunity, it's a divine imperative. Wow, did you hear that? God calls, uh, God calls people to account for failure to enjoy all that he gives. And actually, we see that in, um, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. Remember when the, the, the people have been plowing through the wilderness, uh, Moses reminds them that, uh, that all is not well. And he says, it is not well because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all things. God has given you so much. God is a joyful giver. If actually, God is a community of joyful giving, of joyful self-giving, the Father to the Son, the Son to the Father, and the joy and fellowship of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's who God is, <laughs> a joyous 
a giver enjoying one another. Um, and that God, from him, comes an overflow of gifts towards us. And we're to enjoy them, the abundance of things, the meadows and the hills, the rivers, the kingfishers, the pineapples and the wine, the shelter and warmth and love and relationship and time and opportunity and life and breath. We were to enjoy them because they come from God. And you know what it's like when you give. There is joy in giving in the face of the one who receives, when they receive it well. Yesterday we, we had the, the, the joy of giving as, uh, as Isaac was running around the house clutching his brand new duvet, singing duvet cover, duvet cover, duvet cover. Uh, and that, that, was a, that was a moment that brought us great joy, the delight in his face at receiving the gift delightfully. But imagine he took one look at it and said, boring, can I watch Hey Dougie? I mean, that would be deflating, wouldn't it? That would be a little bit of an insult to the giver. Well, you know what? God hasn't given us a duvet. God has given us life and breath and everything. He's worked salvation for his people. And our response is to, should be to enjoy it. There's Israel on the verge of the promised land. They've been delivered from slavery. They've been rescued from bondage and forced labour for freedom to enjoy God and know him in a land filled with good things, flowing with milk and honey. And what is their response? <sighs> we had cucumbers in Egypt. You did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all things. But not only is it an insult to the giver, and in a sense robs a giver of, uh, of joy, a uh, grumpy response to his gifts. But also, it's deeply sinful. And it's deeply sinful because it's a denial of who he is as that generous giver. It's a repetition of the first sin in the garden. You remember Adam and Eve, they came to believe God was withholding something good from them. And that was the lie that was, uh, that was, that was being... Um, propagated wasn't it by the serpent and so they took upon themselves to grasp after what they uh, considered would be a source of greater joy than, than what they had in other words they doubted that God was being good to them they were charging God with being miserly one writer put it like this this was the nerve the serpent touched in Eden to make paradise appear an insult God said here you are here's Here's all the trees I've put for you in the garden that are pleasing to the eye and good for food. Have them all, apart from that one. And their response? You're keeping something from us. You're a miser. Friends, that's the road that we can end up travelling down if we're not careful. If we refuse to uh, uh, enjoy the gift what it is from the hand of a generous and good God. We can doubt God's goodness. We can seek then after an alternative supplier in our grumpiness instead of our gratitude. And that's dodgy ground, isn't it? I mean, Victor, Victor Melduism, you know, it might make a great sing sitcom, but it makes a terrible way of life. One foot in the grave. So don't let, don't let grumpiness be the lens of your life. It'll become a greenhouse of bitterness and self-pity that sprouts into resentment and ultimately resentment not just of other people, but resentment towards God. And so the writer says, banish anxiety from your heart, cast off the troubles of your body, don't be defined and shaped by the vexations of the heart and the irritations of, uh, of this world, the troubles of your body. Embrace life as a gift to be enjoyed. And, and it starts with the little things, friends. It starts with, you know, uh, the smell of coffee as you pull back the, 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 the foil on a brand new jar. It starts with the feel of the first rays of sun on your back or the taste of fresh fruit or the sight of a loved one or the sound of a song. You don't take joy in these things and you won't take joy in anything. If we're not grateful for the small things, then we won't show gratitude at all. And that won't just make us obnoxious. That actually leads us to doubt the goodness of God the giver. And that matters. And that matters, of course, because one day we're going to encounter him. And so rejoice in the gift, says the teacher, and remember the giver. Remember your creator all the days of your youth before the days of trouble come.
Well, we have in chapter 12, in the, the first bit of chapter 12 that Jeff read to us, uh, really is a sort of poetic pictures of the of the unravelling of life. And um, the writer urges, before that happens, remember your creator. All the days of your youth. And that doesn't mean when you're young. It means the days when you have faculties. Before the process of undoing uh, happens. That's described here in the poems of verses 2 to 7. Yeah, there are a couple of pictures, aren't they? The first uses the imagery of creation. He says, remember your creator. And then uses pictures of creation, Genesis 1 type language, as he talks about the sun and the moon and the lights going dark. And that's, uh, that's kind of a picture, if you like. If the, if the sun and the moon and, and, the, and the stars give light at creation, then going dark is a picture of decreation, of things being unmade, of things falling apart, if you like. The reversal of things. Just as God made a person, so in the end all age and death unmake a person and the clouds simply regather after the storm that's a, a great image of at the desolation of old age you know when you're young uh, the, you know the, the storms come but you can look forward to, to better weather you break your arm but you know you're going to bounce back but as you get older you, you don't have that same hope do you that a fall can be devastating there's no prospect of return to to health and to vigour. There's no promise of a new dawn. The next picture describes that unmaking in a little more detail by using the picture of a house falling into disrepair. The keepers of the house tremble, the strong, strong men soup, the stoop, the grinders cease. Those looking out through windows that grow dim, the doors of the streets are closed. This is this is um, describing a, a person's unravelling in age. The keepers of the house are the arms of the person that used to be strong, but now they tremble. And the, uh, the strong men are the legs that are, are, are bent with the weight of wear and weariness. And the grinders are few remaining teeth. And uh, the dim windows are, of course, the eyes. And the, uh, the doors that become closed to the sound of the bustling of the street are, of course, the ears. And then sleep is robbed, verse 4, and the confidence of youth uh, atrophies into fear, verse 5. The almond trees in blossoms, a picture of the whitening hair that comes with age, and the grasshopper that cannot spring but has to drag itself along the ground. It's a pitiable image, isn't it? Of something not long for this world. You see the picture? Youth, vitality, it's meaningless, it's vapour, it's fleeting, it vanishes. And then we are undone and become dust. Ultimately, the silver cord is severed. The golden bowl is broken. The picture shattered. The, uh, the wheel broken at the well. They're all images of um, the vessel that carry our vitality becoming broken beyond repair. And we return to the dust from which we were formed. This is the sobering reality of life in a fallen world, isn't it? So what are we to do? Well, we're to remember our Creator. Before it happens, remember your creator before the undoing, verse 6. Remember him before the end. Remember him why? Well, here's the thing. Here's a, here's a kind of a warning shot across the bowels. When we have all our vigor and our vitality, what do we think? We think, I can do it on my own. I don't need God in my life. Look at me. I'm full of potential. I'm aching with power. I can go out. I can burn a candle at both ends. I can get up in the morning. I can embrace another day. What do I need? I'm the captain of my own ship. I can make my own way in the world. In other words, we forget that we are creatures dependent on a creator. We forget that we're creatures accountable to a creator with a, with a debt of obedience to a creator as we, as we plough our own furrow and go our own way. That is the danger, isn't it? Uh, when we have our faculties, we think we're autonomous, we think we can be self-sufficient, and that we end up thinking we are the Lord of our own lives, and we, we displace God from his rightful place as we try to steal the crown. Well, that's a dangerous place to be, isn't it? Because that vigour soon unravels. Youth is meaningless. It's a vapour and fleeting. And before long, we'll be standing before our maker.
So remember your creator all the days of your youth so that your life is defined by remembering who you are as you relate to him. You're the creature. He's the creator. But we can say more than that, can't we? This side of Easter, we can say more than that. Remember your creator. Uh, And here's why. Uh, Because your creator is the one who can recreate what is being unmade. Do you hear? Let me say that again. Your creator is the one who can recreate what is being unmade by age. Only the creator can recreate. But therein lies our hope. Jesus Christ came into this world and as he did, God was remembering us. Remember your creator or remember that your creator remembered you in sending his son into the world. Why? Well, he joined us in our frailty and our finiteness to give us the ultimate reason for rejoicing. He came into this world to be unmade that we might be remade. Do you remember the words from the cross that Jesus uh, took to himself from Psalm 22 as he cried, forsaken? Well, Psalm 22 says this, uh, uh, this is the experience of Jesus on the cross as told uh, through the eyes of King David. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It's melted within me. My mouth is dried up. My tongue sticks to the roof of, uh, of my mouth and you lay me in the dust of death. What was happening on the cross is that Jesus was being unmade and laid in the dust of death as he bore uh, the full weight of the curse of Adam. But he bore it for us so that we would never have to. Christ exchanged glory to become a man to be undone and lie in the dust of death so that we who are bound for the dust of death might be created and lifted to the glory of reigning with him for eternity. So that our vanishing and vaporous lives might have substance and future and hope even when faculties are beginning to shut down. And we know know this is a certainty. We know that God has for us after this earthly tent is destroyed, an eternal house that can never be destroyed. uh, Because we've seen it in our history in the person of Jesus Christ. He who went out into death to deal with that curse has risen triumphant. In a glorious resurrection body. And that is a sure sign that the curse has been dealt with. That the grave has been overcome. That the way to life is open. And that there lies ahead of us. Not the troubles and suffering of this world. But something that far outweighs them all. That future weight of glory in resurrection bodies. In bodies that will be full of vitality and life. With ligaments that bounce and fringes that flop. And that don't grow tired and weary. But are forever caught up in rejoicing in the Lord in the presence of Jesus Christ. That is the certainty that the resurrection brings to us. And that is our hope. And that is why uh, the Apostle Paul says, we know if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. And you know what that means? That means that even though life might deal me a path of sorrow now, even though uh, days of darkness uh, may come over me, even though the sun might go dark uh, and the stars not come out, even though the strong man will tremble, I can banish anxiety from my heart and I can cast off the troubles of my body because I know that actually um, uh, the descent into the grave is not the end. It is the end of uh, of the beginning only. And all glory awaits. And I will dwell with God in the heavenly house of a resurrection body. Life in all its fullness. Life in the presence of my Saviour. Oh, that means I have reasons for rejoicing, whatever the weather of this life. And all the little things that we receive now as gift from God are little foretastes of the great banquet and the joys to come. So what do we do? Well, don't live this life in grumbling and in gratitude. But enjoy it and embrace it as a gift of God, remembering he's the giver of the greatest of gifts. May we not descend into resenting God for what we haven't got, but remember our Creator 
who is the recreator, who has established resurrection hope for us. Strong, robust, we may be sown in dishonour, but we shall be raised in glory. Therefore, in the present, keep one foot firmly planted on the path of life and seize it with vigour. Serve the Lord with joyfulness and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all the good things he gives, chiefly expressed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a good God who gives good things and we praise you that you have ultimately uh, given us the greatest thing in securing our life from the grave. Uh, for uh, the goodness of your house. Thank you that, Lord, you are going to transform our, our earthly tents that wear so quickly into that robust, eternal house. Uh, Lord, give us the confidence of faith. Uh, Lord, our lives now might be transformed in the enjoyment of all the hope and good things that you give to your glory and to your joy. In Jesus' name. Amen. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Let's do that now as we say the creed together. Your response is, we believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? 
we believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God, the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And through Christ, in the power of the Spirit, we approach our Father in prayer as June leads us. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you now to offer our praise and thanks. In the difficult times we're living through, may we all keep our eyes fixed on you. You are God. You are in control of everything that happens and we can trust you in all things, even when we can't see how things are working out. You pour out your blessings on us day by day. Help us not to take these for granted, but create in each of us thankful hearts. We remember today Elizabeth, our Queen, as she goes on in life without her beloved husband. Give her your peace, your strength and your comfort. And we pray this for all those who have lost loved ones recently. Please be very close to them, and in particular remembering June Stewart as she mourns the loss of her husband Ian. We ask for your healing touch on those who are sick at this time, thinking especially of Aram in hospital. Let's just take a moment to bring before God all those we know who are sick or suffering, who are lonely or isolated at this time. And we end this time of prayer as we began, thanking and praising our God in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. We draw our prayers together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We close our time together by singing that great hymn, How Great Thou Art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to thee, how great thou art. And it's wonderful because this hymn picks up the idea of enjoying the good things that God has given, the good things that the Creator has made, that we enjoy them to his glory. But it also speaks about the goodness of the Creator in sending his Son that we might be recreated and called home to him in the eternal house. Let's sing.
Well, a big thank you to everybody who's contributed to today. And just uh, a couple of quick things to remind you of. Uh, that is, Christianity Explored is uh, starting in a week or so. Uh, if you know anybody who might be interested, or if you want yourself, just have a, a bit of a refresher, or you've got questions, uh, then please please do let me know, and um, we'll uh, get you set up uh, to enjoy that course. Um, it will be very worthwhile. Secondly, uh, our home groups are, are beginning a new um, topic this uh, this Wednesday, 7.45 via Zoom, uh, as we're looking at gospel-shaped outreach. How do we How do we um, reach our neighbour? How do we tell this good news of how great God is? Uh, gospel-shaped outreach, equipping us for the task of making Christ known. Really important. I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday, 7.45 uh, till 9-ish. Uh, morning prayer will be tomorrow uh, through Saturday, 9 till 9.30 as usual. Now shall we close? Our final prayer. Now may the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself, the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service, and the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you in this day, and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord and enjoy him. In the name of Christ. Amen.